We live in the age of the specialist. In medicine, instead of having a community doctor like we would have in the past, we have neurosurgeons, endocrinologists, interventional radiologists, and more. In finance, instead of just bankers and accountants, we have quantitative analysts, derivative specialists, forensic fraud accountants, and much more. And then in the entertainment industry, you have CGI animators who are just focused on like one aspect of CGI, like someone's hair or water. This specialization is a natural consequence of the increase in complexity and knowledge that we've gone through over the past 100, 200 years. And it's not necessarily a bad development either. We all benefit from specialists. And if I have someone who's performing brain surgery on me, I want them to be a neurosurgeon, not a community doctor. And it's obvious that the world we live in encourages specialization. From the moment we enter primary school, through to high school, college, and then working in what's usually a specialized job, our world encourages specialization. And why wouldn't it? After all, why would you learn multiple skills and multiple disciplines when you can just focus on one, get really good at it, and get paid for it, right? That seems to be the surest path to success. But there are some pitfalls. There are some pitfalls and downsides to this culture of specialization and even to being an extreme specialist yourself, unless that's really what you want to do and you know that you want to do it. First, we are by nature generalists. We are born as children and we are generalists. We naturally engage in multiple activities. We're naturally cognitively flexible. And over time, through the school system, college, and then entering into specialized work, that slowly gets stripped away from us, which may be one reason why a lot of us are dissatisfied with our work, because we're really made for more than just one specialized skill. Desmond Morris, in his book, The Naked Ape, writes that the human is the most non-specialized, adaptive, opportunistic animal of all. And while there are people who enjoy being specialists, like a pro athlete who just does the same thing for decades on end, there are many other people who are told that specialization is the answer, but to them that goes against their nature and their deep inclinations to want to be more multidisciplinary and general. The second pitfall is that specialization is risky. We no longer live in a world where you can work the same job or career for 30, 40 years straight. The world is changing too fast and with it, jobs and careers change. You must be flexible, you must be adaptable, and when you have a narrow skill set and you're only specialized, that reduces your adaptability and your flexibility. It wasn't long ago when being a typist was an in-demand skill, an in-demand job. If you were fast at typing, then you would get hired because people would prefer to say things and you would write it down and so on and so forth. But of course now we have voice recognition software, we have word processors, and so being a typist is not an in-demand role anymore. And if you spend all your time today specializing, working really hard to become the equivalent of the modern world typist, like the equivalent of that job today, then what happens in 10 years when it's obsolete? What risk are you faced with by following that path of specialization? The third pitfall is that specialization limits your perspective and it can lead you into cognitive traps. As the saying goes, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When you're extremely specialized, it is hard to see problems and situations from another perspective outside your field. And so you can get easily tricked as a result and make bad decisions. Let's take a business for example. A experienced specialized financial controller might look at the business and say, well, all the problems in this business are due to the financial makeup of it. These are financial problems. The experienced marketer might say, no, no, no. It's not financial, it's marketing. You, you guys need to fix your marketing. Whereas an experienced operator or operations guy might say, no, no, you have organizational conflict. That's where all your problems are stemming from. But it takes a generalist and a polymathic thinker to look at that business and go, actually, it's a combination of all of those. And we need to see it from the wide perspective. And so on that example, being a specialist actually holds you back. It's less profitable, it's less useful, while the generalist can see it for what it is and make the right decisions. We need this wide perspective and this skill set because many of the problems and situations we face in the modern world today are not specialized in narrow domain, apart from if you're working on the cutting edge of, say, machine learning, 
development, which I know some of you watching this are, so you can just ignore what I'm saying. But things like leading a team, raising children, solving a complex problem in your business, they all require adaptability and flexibility. The answer though is not to avoid specialization altogether. That is not what I'm saying. Specialization is important and it's a much better strategy than just being a casual generalist as we'll look at later in the video. The answer instead is to treat specialization as one aspect of yourself, not your entire self so that you can become multidisciplinary. In other words, become the generalist specialist or what I'm calling the modern polymath. So what is a modern polymath? Well, first of all, modern polymaths are simply T-shaped individuals having a breadth of knowledge and mental models, generalism, while also having above average competence or even expertise in two or more key skills, which is the specialism. They are generally entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs and creatives, people who benefit from being multidisciplinary. They are autodidacts, self-learners, and they have an intense hunger for self-improvement, knowledge, and skill acquisition. So how do you become a modern polymath? I'm gonna share three strategies with you. The first is to lean into your nature and your curiosity. The best way to be more polymathic is to lean into what you're curious about. This means breaking free of the shackles of the mesis, of pursuing what you think you should desire based on what you've seen in others, instead of pursuing your authentic curiosity and desires. For without curiosity, no great work can be done. As Paul Graham writes, interest will drive you to work harder than mere diligence ever could. And Wakas Ahmed, I think that's how you pronounce it, in his book Polymath, confirms this. He says, the link between intelligence and curiosity is important, but it can be argued that curiosity is probably the prime driver of accomplishment. Indeed, it was Einstein who famously proclaimed, I have no special talents, I'm only passionately curious. But it's not just curiosity that you should lean into, it's also about leaning into your nature as well. If you're someone who is naturally introverted, you find it easy to sit down for hours on end by yourself, reading, writing, doing work, then it's clearly in your nature to do so. But many people think they need to change their nature to become something they think they wanna be. And so they work against the grain, the natural introvert thinks, oh, I need to learn how to do sales because I want to be an entrepreneur. And so they go get a sales job and they absolutely hate it and they neglect their nature. They neglect what they're actually good at and just naturally do, which is like sit down, read and write. Or the natural extrovert who could be a great CEO reads some tweet or article about how you should sit down and write for like four hours a day doing deep work. And so that's what they do. It's against their nature. They don't like it and they're neglecting what they would actually excel at because it's in their nature. This is not an easy thing to do at all. Leaning into your nature is hard. David Perala has this incredible tweet and I won't read out the whole thing, but he says, a mark of maturity is surrendering to the person you actually are instead of the one you wish you were. If you're going to be world-class, you have to align yourself with your fingerprint. For example, if you've always thought that you were gonna be a great entrepreneur, but it's in your nature to actually be an artist, then you will likely never be a world-class entrepreneur. It is hard to be excellent at something that is not in your nature. But he also points out that to do this, to surrender to your nature, is more painful than you think. It feels like the death of dreams, even though it's the birth of something more profound. The second strategy is to develop a lattice work of mental models. Charlie Munger once said, the first rule is that you can't really know anything if you just remember isolated facts and try and bang them back. If the facts don't hang together on a lattice work of theory, you don't have them in a usable form. You've got to have models in your head and you've got to array your experience both vicarious and direct on this lattice work of models. Mental models help us understand the world and reduce blind spots in our thinking so that we can make better decisions and ultimately live a better life. For example, if you internalize a mental model like the sunk cost fallacy, which is our reluctance to give up something or abandon a path that we've invested so much time, money or effort into, then it can help you avoid making bad decisions. Maybe you're running a business, you've got these two products or these two projects going on, one you've invested 12 months in, the other one you've invested one month in, the one month project is performing 
way better than this one, but you feel like you need to keep doing this because you've spent 12 months on it. Well, understanding the sunk cost fallacy, you can look at it objectively and go, it doesn't matter how much time I've spent on this. This one is objectively doing better, so I'm gonna abandon this and do this. That's just one example. When you have a lattice work of these mental models, you can see how your ability to make decisions and be wise is far improved. How do you develop these mental models? There's two ways. First, you read. You read a lot, a lot of books. There's a great one called Seeking Wisdom by Peter Bevelin, which I recommend. And then secondly, you put them into action. You do things, you take on projects, you do work, you do things in your business, whatever. You gain experience so you can see how these mental models interact with the real world. The third strategy is to develop your talent stack. Scott Adam writes in his book, How to Foul at Everything and Still Win Big. The best way to increase your odds of success in a way that might look like luck to others is to systematically become good but not amazing at the types of skills that work well together and are highly useful for just about any job. This is what being multidisciplinary is all about. And it's one of the reasons why Scott Adams did so well. It wasn't because he was the best artist or cartoonist. He was decent at that, but he also had a background in the corporate world, which allowed him to understand the inner workings of that. He had a good work ethic. He had good risk tolerance, a good sense of humor. And all these things combined allowed him to do quite well. So you want to stack talents and skills that interact with each other in a way that makes you unique so that you can become one of a kind. To give you an example from my own life, much of my early success in online business came from the combination of my writing ability, which I've been writing for about four years at that point, combined with my knowledge of music production and my background in internet marketing. I had a few failed internet marketing uh, projects and I learned a few things from those. And then the combination of all of those allowed me to get pretty far ahead pretty quickly because there weren't many good blogs in the music production space. And a lot of the, the businesses that were selling like courses and stuff weren't marketing them that well. And so that unique combination helped immensely. Did I plan for that to happen? No, I was just learning skills based on what I was interested in. But I think you should plan it at least to some degree. Now, to end this video, I do want to talk about a few traps, a few things to be aware of, because the pursuit of modern polymathy is a worthwhile one, but it's easy to get derailed. The first one is the curiosity trap. I talked about how you need to be curious about things to become a modern polymath. You really do. But there is a danger in that, and that is that you constantly explore and explore and explore, and you never commit, and you never build the deep competencies you need to have that vertical line in the t-shape you can't just always be building breadth and width you do need to go deep in one or two or three things to really get benefits as the modern polymath this also causes struggles with finishing things and da vinci struggled with this himself to, to finish projects because he was so multidisciplinary and curious and diverse there's actually a quote that i'm pretty sure is attributed to him that says like a kingdom divided which rushes to its doom the mind that engages in subjects of too great variety becomes confused and weakened. Oftentimes you need to narrow your focus before you can widen it again. Following your curiosity is not about neglecting your responsibility or neglecting what you know you should be working on. Related to this is the second trap, which is the casual generalist trap. You want to be competent in at least one area, ideally more. And if you're not serious about building this competency, then you will be a casual generalist. You will be the jack of all trades and master of none. You will fall into this trap if you keep abandoning pursuits as soon as they start getting challenging. Because the first 10, 20 hours of learning a skill, you know, it's exciting, it's new, there's so, the learning curve's like fast uh, and that's rewarding. But at some point it starts to kind of peter out and it becomes much more of a grind. And if you constantly quit in those early stages, then you're never gonna build competency. You're gonna build like surface level skill and knowledge, which isn't really gonna help you that much. So there is an aspect of pushing through, of doing that grinding. I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know where the balance between width and depth is. You need to find that for yourself. But I do think you kind of know when you're cheating yourself, right? You kind of know when you're trying to learn a skill or learn something new and you feel like giving up, that's uh, in that moment where it's like, no, 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 this is a time to push through. It's like an intuitive feeling. 
So don't ignore that. And then the third and final trap is the I know nothing trap. You may find that as you learn more and more, as you become multidisciplinary, that you get this intense realization or feeling that you know absolutely nothing. I know this sounds weird, but you may have experienced it, where you're like exploring something, you're trying to understand something, and there's all these competing ideas, and it all contradicts, and you just get to a point where you're like sitting back, and you're like, oh man, I don't even know what reality is. Like, is this a simulation? Am I even alive? Am I a brain in a vat? I have no idea. This is natural, and it's why Socrates said, the more I know, the more I know that I do not know. But it can be discouraging and it can push you into a trap where you just keep spinning mentally and you can't figure out what is actually true and what is actually right. The solution to this is simple, but it's not easy. You need to get out of your head for some time. Usually if you're stuck in this trap, it's because you're not in motion, you're in stasis and you need to just start doing things. Do the simple work in front of you. Clean your office, work on your simple projects go run some errands or something. Just get yourself in motion, get yourself out of your head. Maybe there's a way to think your way out of this trap, but if there is, I haven't found it yet. That is it for this video. If you enjoyed watching, make sure to like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. And you might also like my newsletter. I send that out once per week. People seem to like it. They stay subscribed. You might like it too. You can find a link to that in the description below.